the intent of the drawings were to promote the idea of evolution, uh, that it was a fact, that this was a real thing. Uh, people should be skeptical of it, and they were skeptical of it, and people should be skeptical of it now. Mm-hmm. There, But he, he, he clearly had an agenda, which was to get this idea that evolution is a true thing. And uh, clearly, he wasn't, it wasn't beyond him to exaggerate in order to get that point across. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Trey, and I have with me today ICR's president, Dr. Randy Galuza. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. G. Oh, thanks for the invite. Absolutely. Uh, I'm really excited about this particular episode. Um, As I was just saying, we just recorded an episode with Dr. Tompkins, and I always think it's really interesting to talk about the history behind some of these uh, beliefs that have uh, kind of invaded their way into our culture. Uh, and this is one of those. Uh, and I, I, I think that it's it's amazing uh, to just see where it came from. So we're going to be talking about Ernst Haeckel. Uh, won't find many people named that these days, I don't think. Uh, he was a German dude, a zoologist, uh, and uh, he is most famous for developing a series of images and uh, can you tell us a little bit more about maybe uh, who he was, what he did, et cetera? Well, you're right on in talking about the history of these ideas because there's a lot more to it than just the actual event. Mm-hmm. And in this particular case, we're going to be talking about Heckel's embryos, yeah. as they've been known as. But you have to go deeper. Why did we get to the point where we're even talking about Heckel's embryos along these lines? And Ernst Haeckel, as you mentioned, he was German, but he was a firm believer in Darwinian evolution. And uh, we're talking about him today because it looks like he committed a major fraud Mm -hmm. on everybody, including myself. I was pulled into his fraud when I was in high school, uh, all these things. And in 1874, and I hope our, our viewers can catch this right now, he came up with a series of drawings comparing all different kinds of creatures, you know, and he took them through their embryological development. So you almost have to kind of visualize, or you can see it on the screen here, like a spreadsheet where you have different types of, indiv- of individuals, and then you start from like a single egg, and you go all the way through to um, maturity of development, right, for okay. a human being and be like right at birth. Okay. And he compared these different creatures at these different stages, and he said this was proof positive of Darwinian evolution, and his drawings then were repeated and copied in one form or another over and over again throughout different textbooks, mm-hmm. and particularly high school textbooks, biology textbooks. And in 1992, when I was in med school, they were even in my med school textbooks, my textbook on embryology, and it contributed nothing to the text, but there was a rendition of Heckel's embryos and leading people astray. So hopefully everybody's had a chance to see what I'm talking about on the screen by now. And mainly he was making three major arguments by putting up his his embryos. Okay. Argument number one was that life went from simple to complex. It started out in this simple way, and it went to a more complex form. Which is a huge part of evolutionary theory. Oh, you bet. Yeah, Yeah, it's, it's a major part of their theory. Mm-hmm. As you're talking about, it's a, it's a part of the theory that life goes from simple to complex over time, and Darwin's mechanism from getting it to simple to complex was a struggle to survive. Natural selection. Natural yeah. selection. That you know, There was this competition for scarce resources, and the ones who could get the resources survived. Therefore, they were obviously, what, better mm-hmm. than the others, which put creatures on an upward trajectory. So life went from simple to complex over time. Second, He was arguing that humans and these other creatures shared a common ancestor, shared a common ancestor. And this was obviously evident by the similarities that people could see between these embryos, particularly when in the very, very early stages, they were like, wow, these are, these are very, very similar to each other. Why would they, why would you have a turtle embryo being so similar to a human embryo? Why would you have a chicken embryo being so similar to a human embryo, 
if they didn't share some remote common ancestor way, way in the past. Right. And then third, he was saying that as we looked at these embryos and you would follow them through development, you could see the actual history of the evolution of life on Earth, that they went through a, a primitive stage and then a little more advanced stage and then finally the advanced stage. Mm -hmm. So you could see that. And therefore, it was, um, it was a phrase that I learned when I was a kid called um, phylogeny recapitulates ontogeny. Which is, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a mouthful. Uh, can you kind of break down what that means? Yeah. yeah. It means that um, when you're looking at the ontogeny, this development of these embryos through time, it's actually a little mirror or it's a picture into the past, a window into the past, probably a better way of phrasing it, a window in the past of looking at the evolutionary development over all of these things. Okay. And so that's, and, and, and when I picked up textbooks, so I found my high school textbook that was, I used in 1975. Long still have it. Before you were born. Yeah. <laughs> and this is what it said. It, it, this was from 1972, Keaton in 1972. It says, for example, on these, these points that I was talking about here, for example, the early human embryo has a well-developed tail and a series of gill pouches in the pharyngeal region. And then to the other point that I was making, it says human and fish embryos resemble each other because human beings and fish share a common remote ancestry. Mm. So right there in the text, and as you can imagine, um, me seeing this for the first time, and I went on to do more science, but many high school students, this is the only time they'll ever see this. Right. First and only time that you see this. And it seemed to be so persuasive. Mm -hmm. I mean, here you have these drawings. Look at this development. Clearly, things go from simple to complex. Clearly, we share this common ancestor. And then, of course, it, it did look like they were going through these stages over time on right. that. I do, I do recall, uh, so I learned about, you know, this particular piece of artwork. And, and I went to a, a private Christian school, so it was not from an evolutionary standpoint, but they taught us about this because they knew that we would experience it, you know, out beyond the walls of the high school. And, and they were uh, saying, you know, my, my teachers were saying, this is something like, you'll look at this and they'll say, Oh, this, this baby, this, this child, speaking about humans in particular, this child is currently only a fish or this child currently is only a lizard. Uh, and that to me, I mean, right off the bat, that flies in the face of, of what we know from scripture about humanity being made in God's image. Uh, and animals in, in their entirety uh, are a completely separate demographic, if you will, of, of creature. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, you were totally misled. Yeah, I was misled. And everything about this, you know, I don't, I don't want to even mince words, was totally misleading. Mm -hmm. The drawings, is, uh, I'll, I'll read you some quotes here in just a second mm -hmm. as we go through this podcast, were faked. And we now know that they were faked. We now know that they were exaggerated. We now know that they minimized differences and exaggerated similarities between all of these things. Okay. But uh, even more fundamental, humans never have gill slits. Right. And humans never go through a place where they develop a tail. And so even in these drawings, it's misleading. The characterization in my high school textbook was misleading. Um, and even in my med school textbook, it was somewhat misleading because I, I, I eventually began, began to realize that, hey, oh, no, this, is, this isn't a tail on a human being. This is how little babies develop. They mm -hmm. they lay down a backbone first, and it's pretty much the whole length of the of the little baby, and then the rest of the baby grows into it. So there's a period of time where the where the backbone is a little bit longer than the baby, mm. but baby grows into it. It's never like there's a tail that regresses right okay. along those lines. And then f these pharyngeal folds and pouches, which I learned about. Uh, which I, I believed at one time had gill tissue in them, never had gill tissue, never will have gill tissue. They develop into important structures. Your jaw, mm. the lower part of your face, 
various glands in your neck, your thyroid gland, parathyroid glands, all of these things. Uh, it's like, well, this was this was totally wrong, and, totally wrong. And like you said, uh, like. In, in your high school class, you know, some of those students will never look or think about this again. Uh, and it's only through your actual studies as, as a medical doctor that you were able to overcome some of these thought processes. And, and some people may even say, I, I think about the tail, the baby grows into the spinal column, right? Or the backbone, the, it's not a tail that regresses to someone who's not a scientist or a medical doctor, that may mean nothing, right? And right. so they may be like, it's the same thing, right? But you know that it's a very different thing uh, and that the fact that the backbone is already there and the baby growing into it makes it a completely different, like completely negates the idea of a tail. So I, I find that interesting, even just like small, the small minutia of how a baby forms in the womb kind of negates some of, I mean, not some of all of these uh, drawings um, question about maybe his purpose. So we've talked about like the, the three things that he was trying to promote, but what was the purpose of trying to promote, you know, life evolving from primitive, uh, simple animals, uh, a common ancestor and, you know, the synopsis of evolution in a womb. What was in his mind? Not that you can read his mind. I mean, he's not here anymore. He's, he's long, long since passed away, but what is his purpose? Do you think of like trying to do this? What is, what is the reason behind it? Well, it's clearly to promote the whole concept of evolution. Okay. Um, I don't know whether he has any other purposes. Like you say, I don't, I can't, I'm not God, so I can't read right. his mind, even if we could go back. But the intent of the drawings were to promote the idea of evolution, uh, that it was a fact, that this was a real thing. Um, people should be skeptical of it, and they were skeptical of it, and people should be skeptical of it now. Mm -hmm. There, But he, he, he clearly had an agenda, which was to get this idea that evolution is a true thing. And uh, clearly, he wasn't. It wasn't beyond him to exaggerate, in order to get that point across. But that's not. He's not the only one who has done that with evolutionary theory in in the past. So that was his. That was his purpose. I don't know whether he had any other agendas, fame, or any of those other kind of things. I don't know. But in this particular case, I know it is to get the idea of evolution uh, in people's minds and. He used it because it's a it's a vehicle which people can understand. Mm. You know, it's not a it's not an incredibly complex scientific thing to have to drudge through where you're going to lose half the people and the others. It's going over their head. Nobody's catching it. Right. They everybody knows a chicken and a fish and this and they 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 know it develops from an egg to a chicken and things like this. So it was a, it was an easy way for him to show something. And therefore, it was very powerful. Mm. And as you mentioned, you know, this was the only exposure that some of these high school students will ever ever have. They don't go on to that. It boom, it locks in their mind. This is fact, and it goes on. I guess maybe this for a shameless plug for our podcasts. That's why. That's why we do this. That's yeah. why we do these podcasts. Because yeah. the last time you saw these drawings was in a high school textbook, and now we're telling you that these things are were fraudulent. Yeah, and it, they're recognized in the evolutionary community as fraudulent also uh, in in a lot of ways. I think, you know, even at the time, he received criticism for these, right? Right, he did. A fellow embryologist criticized him. They said he was fake. So I, it's a perfect time to just, we'll just read some quotes from yeah. some evolutionists. You said evolutionists have uh, mentioned this. Well, a paper in Science came out in 1997. Science is probably the leading scientific journal for the United States. And it was had a quote, um, it, had, it had a whole article on Heckel's drawings. Okay. So let me just read the, just some summary. I can't read the whole article by any means, but here's, the, here's a punchline. Generations of biology students may have been misled by a famous set of drawings of embryos published 123 years ago, this was in 1997, by the German biologist Ernst Heckel. And it goes on to say, and you know, because there was a debate, 
whether he actually, because there was a debate whether he actually did these things intentionally or whether he was just maybe a little bit overzealous or whatever it was. But being overzealous is still intentional. And so this article went on to say, unfortunately, Heckel was overzealous. When we compared his drawings with real embryos, we found that he showed many details incorrectly. For example, we found variations in the embryonic size, external form, and segment number, which he did not show. It kind of sums up by saying, it looks like it's turning out to be one of the most famous fakes in biology. Hmm. Another man, Stephen Jay Gould, probably the leading evolutionary theorist up until his death a couple decades ago, he he doesn't really pull any punches either. Uh, commenting on this, where some people noted that Heckel had used, quote, artistic license in putting these together, Gould says this, and this was in 2000, an article he wrote in, in 2000. I do dislike the common phrase, artistic license, especially for its parochially smug connotation when used by scientists that creative humanists care little for empirical accuracy. After all, the best artistic distortions record great skill and conscious intent. But I don't know how else to describe the work of Heckel. To cut to the quick of this drama, Heckel had exaggerated the similarities by idealizations and omissions. He also, in some cases, in a procedure that can only be called fraudulent, simply copied the same figure over and over again, Heckel's drawings, despite their noted inaccuracies, entered into the most impenetrable and permanent of all quasi-scientific literatures, standard student textbook, uh, textbooks of biology. Once ensconced in textbooks, misinformation becomes cocooned and effectively permanent because, as stated above, textbooks copy from previous texts. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's that says a lot right there. Once it's there, it's like you can't get rid of it because uh, everyone just believes that that's right. If that's what every person who goes through the school system is taught, what what else is there, right? Right, right. So this isn't just you know uh, us zealot uh, creationists who are just coming here to hammer and to pound on Ernst Haeckel, right? And you say, oh, we don't we don't agree with this. It's fraudulent. No. These other members of his own community, both ardent evolutionists, zealous evolutionists themselves, recognize that these drawings were absolutely and totally faked. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, that seems to me like, and again, like I can't read his mind, um, but listening to the quote from Gould, you know, there's intentionality there of, of even artistic license, um, because there are like, there's two options here, right? He's either overzealous or he's a liar, right? There, there's only two options there, or he was just completely mistaken. In which case, why are we taking his word to begin with? Right? So I guess three options. Um, and so, uh, the fact that other evolutionists are saying like, Hey, this is, do not listen to this. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I'd like to take a step back just a little bit. This leads to a larger question uh, at hand, and we'll label this here our random science question of the day. Uh, It's not so random today. It's very related. It's very much a part of the the greater issue, especially as we look back at some of the old theories and some of the old beliefs. Uh, So here's the question. Why is the history, the the scientific history of evolution, all the way from, like we'll say beginning with Darwin, but I, there were some before, right? But essentially starting with Darwin, why is the history of evolutionary science, and science of course is in quotes, so full of fraud and like deception and uh, misdirection? What's, what is going on there? Wow, that's a great question. And um, you're right. There, there is a lot in evolutionary science. So I would, um, I, I recognize when I point a finger at somebody else, f- fingers are pointing back at me. Always. And then, so nobody is without fraud. But in evolutionary science, there appears to be a history of these frauds. And so we're talking about 
Heckel's Embryos, mm-hmm. Fraud, Piltdown Man, Fraud, Gill Slits, Fraud, mm-hmm. Tails, Fraud, Archaeoraptor, Fraud, Junk DNA, Fraud. fraud. Vestigial organs. Vestigial organs. Fraud. These are all frauds. And why I say they're a fraud is because people discovered, oh, this is this is not really right. Mm-hmm. But it gets perpetuated to advance the narrative anyway. And so when you're doing that, you're doing something totally fraudulent. Now, Piltdown Man was discovered, but it wasn't for 40 years, so it had already done its damage. People even got knighthood over studying Piltdown Man. Archaeoraptor, oh, yeah, <laughs> was discovered, but you know, it made its way into National Geographic. And in many people's minds showed a connection between dinosaurs and birds. Mm -hmm. Junk DNA, I don't know how many uh, complaints I have from parents who said, you know, my my kid went off to college and he learned that 90-some percent of all of his DNA was junk, some evolutionary leftover. How in the world do you explain that? And you've got broken genes that you find in chimps and humans and chimps and and, and all in humans as well. How do you explain that? So these, these frauds do their damage. So without um, attributing ill motives, per se, to anybody else, I'll tell you one of the main reasons that frauds are so prevalent in evolutionary theory is because the theory is so heavily, and I mean heavily dependent upon imagination. They fill in the gaps with major runs of very, very fertile imagination. And Darwin started it. You know, he, he could imagine a simple light spot evolving into an eye mm-hmm. by pure imagination. He could imagine a creature like a bear floating in the water over time morphing into a whale. And so you have this, this process in evolutionary day, which is look, imagine, and then you see it. In your mind's eye, you see exactly what you're looking for. So when people are studying a human brain case on Piltdown Man— they can imagine, they they clearly see, but it's really only in their mind's eye, primitive ape-like features on it. And they describe them in the journal Science. Mm. Oh, we see these things. Look, imagine, see. And that captures them over and over again so that they make these major blunders. And the imagination is affecting what they see, right? That's right. It's influencing... it's influencing their their mental, like all sort of logic goes out the window then at that point because you're like, well, this is what I want to see, so therefore I see it. Exactly. And imagination fills in the gaps. Yeah. Even okay. Stephen Jay Gould, he, he mentions this. He, it's, he calls it extrapolation mm. as part of the theory. In fact, it's one of the pillars of evolutionary theories, extrapolation, because you can't go back in time to see, actually see these things, you have to extrapolate, or I would just say you have to imagine. Mm. And the amount of imagination that you must invoke is proportional to the amount of time you have to go, you have to travel backwards in. So you have to invoke tremendous amounts of imagination through all of these things, which can never be verified. It's Mm. not real science. Uh, I don't know why... More creationists aren't shouting this problem of imagination driving evolutionary theory. Imaginations leading them into blunders, like Piltdown Man, leading them into blunders, like Archaeoraptor, blunders about the appendix, vestigial organs, as you as you mentioned, blunders like Heckel's embryos. It leads them into these blunders, and it makes them susceptible to these frauds. Yeah. Speaking of. We do have a book by you called 20 Evolutionary Blunders. Uh, so I figure I'll plug that now. If you want to, uh, if our listeners and viewers want to learn more about some of those blunders that this does end up leading them into, there's a good, a good uh, series of examples right there. So yeah, that's a good one. And, yeah. and not only are they blunders, but they're failed predictions. Yeah. You're, if you have a robust theory, you should be able to make some predictions and they should be testable. But evolutionary theory, all their predictions, like say vestigial organs and all these things, these these predictions fail one right after the other, which is another example and reason why we should be highly suspect of evolutionary thinking and the whole theory altogether. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you. That was a 
uh, in my opinion, for what that's worth, uh, that is a very solid answer, and uh, I'm I'm glad to hear it. And and it is as we do these podcasts, it's something that I tend to hear like more and more, especially as we talk about some of the historical stuff. It's like, why is it so full of fraud? Because someone needed it to be true, right? So someone just desperately wanted it to be true, so they said it was true. It is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, come back to uh, Heckel um, and and his his series of artwork. Um, and so it's wrong. Like we know it's wrong. The evolutionists there have have stated that hey, this is not an accurate depiction of what actually happens. Artistic license is it a fraud? Is he overzealous? Who knows? But it's not right. But it has still gripped the collective mind of, of humanity, like ever since it was introduced and it's undoubtedly done damage. Uh, it's undoubtedly caused problems. Uh, what are, what are some of the issues that have arisen from this, uh, general belief in, um, these, uh, you know, the recapitulation theory ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Is that good? Right. That's right. Okay. There you go. Uh, that's hard to say. Uh, all right. So, what are some what are some negatives that have just impacted the world because of this? Well, let's start with just the one you just mentioned that that whole idea that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny misled people, and so it it misled scientific research for decades. Mm-hmm. And most recently, I, I I could point out the quote. Uh, another scientist said that whole idea is effectively, quote, dead as a doornail. Mm. So it, it was never right to begin with. So the fact that you misled scientists is one of the implications. Two, you misled millions of students worldwide that they could make, they, that they thought they were seeing solid evidence for evolution like I thought I was seeing mm-hmm. there. And therefore, what's happened to me is now I have less trust than I certainly did when I was in high school. So when I was in high school, teachers told me something, I believed it. Yeah. And why? They're teachers. They tell me the truth. Right. And that and now I know I realize that teachers have agendas too, yeah. and they're pushing an agenda. So it it damaged my faith once I found started. Oh, this was wrong. Hey, I was mis- I was misled on this. I was lied to, and up to right now, scientists are facing a crisis of trust by the general public. It was most recently exacerbated by the COVID crisis, where they were telling you to follow the science, follow the science, but then you re- the public was beginning to realize, well, what science are you talking about? Last week's science or this week's science? Yeah. which will probably be different from next week's science. So you're pounding me on the head to follow the science, and the science is a is a moving target all the time. And not only that, um, there was such disagreement amongst some of the scientists, do this, no, no, that's the exact opposite of what you need to do. So now you have a crisis in the public trust of scientists in general. Which, Which can be very negative overall, it can. too. Yeah. It can, because there's times when, you know, I want you to trust me to take this medication. I, it, it will help you. We have studies to demonstrate that. Yeah. And then they say, well, the, are they the same studies that you had about this vaccine that mm-hmm. you're telling me about? So it can be very, very negative. In our particular case, I think it's, it's useful because uh, when it comes to evolution, people seem to like just swallow it down very gullibly mm-hmm. without really, really examining the science. So here's a case where people were completely misled on that. And then, of course, there's the, the problem where um, the uniqueness of humanity and the specialness of humanity was minimized. Um, people who are made in the image of God, human beings which are it so obviously different mm-hmm. than animals were um, made to be seen as nothing more than just a more highly evolved animal. And therefore, all the atrocities and everything that can follow on with that, where the value of a, a human being 
is minimized and the whole idea that humans are special and they're not to be abused or misused in any way is minimized, which led to, as you and I had a talk a few months ago on eugenics, Mm -hmm. and then by extension, abortion, by extension, euthanasia, and on and on it goes, where you begin to view human beings as nothing more than just an animal plus time. Right. And that's actually, that's interesting, because one of my first thoughts here is, you know, if, if a mother is, is going through a pregnancy and, uh, you know, they're considering some form of abortion, uh, and then they're told by their doctor or they remember in high school that like, Oh, before a child is born, it's not actually human. It's just a salamander at this point. Uh, I imagine that that affected the thinking of a, of a lot of, a lot of people at the time. Oh, I know it did. Yeah. It affected my thinking in high school. And I grew up younger thinking that humans were special, but I guarantee you, I wasn't a believer at that time. By the time I finished high school, I wasn't seeing humans Mm. as special, as something unique. Just animals. Just animals. Wow. That is a pretty big effect. Maybe one of the largest effects that uh, this could have had, uh, you know, because... Humans are made in the image of God, and uh, they have, a, you know, just a little lower than the angels, you know. Okay, so a bunch of negatives here, a bunch of negatives from Heckel's embryos. Why is it important that we even talk about this? Again, I, I know that we'll we'll get comments, and and I'll just nip those in the bud. We'll get comments to be like, oh, well. Ernst Heckel was, he was a hundred years ago. Nobody listens to him anymore anyway. And so why are you bringing it up? And uh, that's my internet commenter voice. Uh, Why is it important that we discuss this now? Because the history is important. One, they were wrong and you shouldn't just sweep the history under the rug. Because this was supposedly a strong evidence that you were predicting. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was totally wrong. And when all of the blunders that have been on the trail of evolutionary theory are swept under the rug, then people don't realize how bad of a theory it, it has been. So you, you need to know some of the history in order to n- get the feeling that, wow, this theory has been consistently wrong. It's talking about vestigial organs, totally wrong. It makes these predictions wrong. It it, it's, it, it's been wrong over and over. Mm-hmm. Second, the major problem, which is look, imagine, see, is still dominant in evolutionary theory, and it shuts down scientific research. I was about to say, that does not sound like the, th- the scientific method I know. Right. Yeah. Okay. But it's there. Yeah. It, um, and, and it shuts down research. Junk DNA. Oh, We find DNA, it's not coding for specific proteins. Instead of asking the question, well, what is it doing? Mm. Could it be serving a purpose? It was labeled decades ago as junk. And then it took on a life of its own. And some some evolutionists will not let go of it. And they're gonna you're gonna have to pry junk DNA from their cold dead fingers uh, on this. They will not let these things go. Even when study after study shows, oh, this DNA, which you thought was junk, it's regulatory. It does other things. It's, it's, it's not wreckage and carnage yeah. that's left over from our evolutionary past. I mean, even Francis Collins was writing about it in one of his books that it's the jetsam and flotsam of our evolutionary past and, and clearly evidence for evolution because no intelligent designer would ever build this junk in. So the legacy of what Heckel was doing lives on in modern-day counterparts like junk DNA. That's why it's important. The underlying problem, the root cause, still goes on. And unless you make the correct diagnosis, you cannot treat it effectively. So why are we talking about Heckel's problem? Well, you're right. It was over well over 100 and some years ago. But... What led him astray, aside from his fraudulent behaviors, was this belief that this was true, and he would look and see exactly what he wanted to see. Yeah. It sounds 
more and more like it's not just heckle's problem it's evolution's problem like the theory is is problematic um and which of course we know we know that we know that it is problematic this is just one of many examples uh and we will continue to bring these examples to light because they lead to negative things uh, like we talked about eugenics like one of the most negative things that can happen on our planet happened because of a strong belief in evolutionary theory. So yeah. Wow. Okay. Do you have any other, uh, thoughts or any, uh, final, uh, bits of wisdom for our listeners and viewers? Sure. Since probably some creationists are watching this as well as evolutionists. Yeah. Um, we as creationists need to examine everything we're talking about very, very carefully and make sure that we have not imported uh, poor evolutionary thinking into our own thinking and into our own explanations. It, it creeps in all the time. And um, therefore, we need to examine, are, are we explaining things like an evolutionist might explain them? You know, ICR has just done a complete about face on our cave fish. And I've mentioned this in several of my talks and at conferences. I mentioned at the International Conference on Creation this summer. I read our original explanation for cavefish. Oh, that these fish were swimming around. This is, I'm not quoting us exactly, but paraphrasing us pretty close. Sure. That these fish, you know, when they have eyes, it's a big advantage in the sunlight. But when you get into the cave, they're a big disadvantage. You can swim around. You can scrape and scratch your eyes against the wall. You can get diseases. And therefore, uh, random genetic mutations over time led to the eventual loss of eyes and the selective pressure of the cave drove them all eventually to blindness. Mm. And as you then begin to examine, what were we telling people? Oh, we were telling people random genetic mutations was the, was the cause of this. It was a negative in that environment. Selective pressures drove them all along until they were eventually all blind. And then you ask yourself, well, how was that really different than how an evolutionist would explain it? Mm -hmm. It wasn't. Random mutations being fractioned out by a struggle to survive, driven along by selective pressures. Just a shorter amount of time. Right? Just a shorter amount of time. And we would put the caveat, well, that shows how you break an eye but not make an eye. Right. Or put some of these little, these little trite comments on there when we should have been thinking, wait a second here. These fish, they have eyes? And now they have no eyes. They're still alive in the cave. And it hasn't been a long period of time. I mean, actually, how in the world would you explain it in any evolutionary fashion to gradually lose your eyes over time? Right. They're thriving. They're doing, they have all kinds of changes in behaviors and anatomy and physiology to go along with these eyes. And it's happening not just in fish, but in crustaceans, salamanders, insects. I mean... They're all losing their pigmentation, losing their eyes. Maybe, maybe, maybe they were designed mm. to do something like this. Maybe we should explain it from an engineering perspective. So we were even led astray because we were not skeptical enough of the things that we were hearing in school, hearing in high school, hearing in college, and and really examining them, not just within scripture, but even with other science and logic. So a word of advice to all of us creationists, examine ourselves, see if we've imported any evolutionary thinking into our own explanations. Absolutely. And uh, we'll link to, uh, we have three podcast episodes that kind of discuss um, kind of the idea that you're talking about with the cave fish, you know, uh, what's the issue with natural selection. And then uh, we have a couple of episodes on CET. So I'll link those. Uh, so that our viewers and listeners, uh, if you didn't see those, those are some er those are some early podcasts. Those are some of the first ones we did. Uh, so uh, if you if you haven't seen those, you should go watch them. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is I, I really as I was telling Dr. Tompkins, you know, we just filmed an, another episode before this. I think talking about the history of evolution is just one of the most fascinating in kind of like a weird way, not like a, Oh, it's great. Cause it's not great, but it is interesting to see where it all comes from. So, uh, thank you for shedding light and, uh, you have any other final thoughts? No, that was no, it. I think, it? I think we've covered all the bases 
It's an important topic. It's old, but it's important. I wouldn't be surprised if I could go out there today and find a high school textbook that still has these fraudulent drawings in it uh, right now. So young people, watch these podcasts. And until we do another podcast together yeah. on that, I know we'll have another important topic. Yeah. Uh, um, I just uh, pray the Lord's blessing as you as you interview so many of our other fellow scientists. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, we we love having you on here, of course, and uh, of, uh, so, someday, someday we'll be back. All right. And thank you to all of our viewers and listeners. Uh, we really appreciate you watching this episode with us, this uh, particularly interesting topic, at least to me. Uh, if you want to get the Creation Podcast a week early or you want to get creation.live two weeks early, uh, we recommend that you uh, become a member here on YouTube or you can become a patron over on Patreon. Uh, the links are in the description below. We do have a couple of tiers that allow you to see these podcasts early, uh, as well as some other perks and goodies. And we encourage you to do that. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe, share, uh, and just, I mean, really think about the information that you're consuming. Uh, there's a lot of information out there on the internet. Um, and you've been taught a lot of information growing up. Uh, whatever your age is, you've learned a lot from culture. So just make sure that you're viewing those things with a critical eye so that you know what you're actually consuming. And uh, so we'll see you next time on the Creation Podcast. We want to say a huge thank you to our members and patrons. If you'd like to see your name here and unlock perks like early access to our podcasts, members only polls and live streams, behind the scenes footage or exclusive video content, links are in the description below.